I'm Michael During from Sun Microsystems. I'll be speaking today about a chipset for building compact yet high performance 3D graphics accelerator. After describing our design goals, we'll describe who our customers are and what they would be doing with such a machine. We'll then give a uh, overview of previous architectures as a way of motivating the choices that we made. And after describing our general approach, uh, I'll go through the architecture in more detail by talking about the individual chips in the pipeline. Then we'll say a few words about our design environment and conclude with a discussion of the performance. We wanted to build a full-featured 3D graphic accelerator, minimizing both price and physical size, but without minimizing uh, the performance. The traditional customers for such a machine are mechanical CAD, BioCAD, scientific visualization. We also wanted to address emerging markets in animation, entertainment, and virtual reality. Such machines have to support fairly uh, formal primitives nowadays of 3D triangles, lines, and dots. We also have to be able to accelerate, though, normal desktop productivity applications. After all, these machines will be used for normal everyday office work and mail, as well as uh, their 3D work. Some machines, in order to reduce price, uh, have uh, tried to reduce resolution. But we had to meet industry standard resolutions of uh, 1280 by uh, 1024. And we also wanted to support a full 24-bit uh, double buffered frame buffer with a 24-bit Z buffer. Uh, many previous machines in our price point um, have not been able to achieve the full three 24-bit buffers, but we felt that was very important. We also felt it was important to stretch for both stereo support and virtual reality device support. This image is an example of the sort of things that people will do with such machines. This is a two and a half million polygon image. And although that's rather larger than some people do interactively, it is actually fairly typical of the uh, triangle complexity found in many aerospace applications. In automotive and mechanical CAD applications, you might only have two or three cars spinning away there. And I'm not sure if you could see it, but in the upper right-hand portion of the image, uh, there's a, a 707 has just taken off. And there's 50,000 triangles just in that aircraft until we retract the landing gear. OK, let's try to motivate our approach by talking a little bit historically what goes on in 3D graphics pipelines. This diagram is a truly generic diagram of the uh, transformation pipeline used in uh, most contemporary machines. Starting off the top, after we've pulled in the data input, we had the transformation stage, then check for clipping. With the tricks nowadays, we generally don't have to clip, but we still have to check for it. Uh, we have to determine which face a particular primitive is facing toward us. Uh, we then have to apply lighting, figure out where the light is coming in and how much of it comes out of the polygon. Then we actually perform the clipping uh, if it turned out to be needed. We then do the perspective divide, which used to be where all the excitement was 20 years ago, and now it's just you know, one bullet among dozens. Um, we then do the final conversion to screen space coordinates and set up for incremental rendering. This is the top half of the pipeline, as I'll be uh, referring to it uh, in successive slides. Below that, we then have the screen space um, primitives, uh, where we go through, for triangles at least, we go through edge walking, span interpolation, um, and z-buffered uh, rendering right into uh, the frame buffer. Uh, and then finally, coming out of the frame buffer, we have some additional post-processing, double buffering, and lookup tables uh, before the final digital to analog conversion, and the pixels come uh, flying as photons out uh, to the user. Now, early 3D graphics architectures had pipelines that looked very similar uh, to this diagram. They just had blocks um, uh, of hardware corresponding to each of these larger blocks that I've shown here. But then people wanted to make them faster, and so they started dividing up the pipeline into smaller and smaller blocks, but soon discovered that this became uh, rapidly unwieldy, then that the whole machine would run as slow as the slowest element in the pipeline. Uh, and so a new approach had to be found. In the mid-'80s, a number of architectures moved to what I'll call data parallel graphics pipelines, where the entire upper half of the pipeline I described previously was squashed down back into one box again, 
what's in this diagram is labeled transformation etc. unit. Um, but multiple of these units were deployed in parallel um, so that you can have multiple primitives all being uh, processed at the same time. Now this sort of architecture uh, got around a lot of the problems of the previous one, but introduced some more of its own, in that such architectures are very hard to load balance, especially when the common requirement of in-order rendering uh, is required. That is, when the user submits thousands of primitives in a particular order, the user expects those primitives to be rendered in the frame buffer in that same order. And unfortunately, the Z buffer alone is not enough to ensure the uh, proper semantics, and you have to be able to keep the order. Um, so a number of machines would have problems where one of those transformation etc. units would gorge itself on a large meal of a long triangle strip, whereas the other uh, units might only get a very light snack of a single triangle. And as a result, uh, all but one of the units would go completely idle and therefore not being used, while the one glutton is sitting there digesting its meal. Uh, there are several approaches to uh, resolving this problem. Most such architectures, as I've already telegraphed, have decoupling FIFOs before and after the transformation unit. Unfortunately, these decoupling FIFOs take up expensive board real estate, power, and cooling, not to mention silicon cost. And there's a limit to how big you can build them before there's too much latency um, and uh, 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 other issues. Um, also, this is not enough to solve the problem in the general case, so most architectures also include a component uh, of some input pre-processing to try to divide up the primitives into more bite-sized segments. This is the approach we took on Leo to an extreme. Our architecture has an element at the top, Leo command, which breaks up all primitives into as small of isolated pieces as possible, i.e. long triangle strips are broken up into individual triangles, uh, long polylines and polypolylines are broken up into individual vectors, and well, dots are already broken up into dots. Then these isolated primitives are distributed to the individual floating point units um, uh, below, labeled Leo float. Now this is a little bit of extra floating point work because we can't take advantage of chaining in the data, uh, but it's greatly simplified our processing. We also found that long triangle strips are normally encountered only in marketing benchmarks. Real users don't tend to put uh, as many strips together, isolated uh, quadrilaterals as many times as large as you get. Uh, and we want to architect a machine for users, not just for marketing benchmarks. So below the Leo command stage there, those boxes labeled Leo floats um, are individual floating point microprocessors, as I'll describe uh, uh, more later on. Each one is operating completely independently from the others, processing their own primitives in their own time. Below the Leo floats, we have an array of Leo draws, which are our individual rendering chips. These are also spatially subdivided to be able to work rather on, rather than working on different primitives at the same time, the Leo draws all work on different pieces of the same primitive at the same time, because now we're in screen space and it's much easier to divide up the primitives into more and more pixels. Below the Leo draws is the DRAM and VRAM comprising the frame buffer, and below that, chip labeled Leo cross does the uh, post-processing work uh, from the frame buffer, getting ready for the final digital to analog conversion in the RAM DAC and output. Now, there's one more important point that can be made from this uh, slide. This is not just a block diagram of the Leo architecture. This is a chip level diagram of the Leo architecture in that every chip in the Leo system is shown in this diagram by a garishly colored rectangle. There are only two non-memory or custom chips in the entire Leo system, and those are the RAM DAC and clock generator, because it wouldn't let me build those as a custom chip this time. Okay, um, well, I'll now go through the Leo pipeline uh, a little more detail. Um, the first chip is Leo command. It is the system interface, bus master, and system controller. It could perform both DMA transfers from the host processor uh, as well as act as a slave um, on Sun's uh, SBUS interface. Below that, Leo command has a variety of function units to help in its process of breaking up primitives into isolated units. We have a bucket buffer for assembling multiple primitives, averaging over DMA bursts. Uh, we have a format converter that converts all manner of different strange numeric types, uh, uh, bytes, characters, fl single precision floating point, double precision floating point, fixed point representations, all into one common numeric format of single precision IEEE floating point. Below this, we have the vertex buffer that helps get ready to 
preserve the semantics of which strangles were where and, and where they were going. And then finally, this is uh, output uh, down into the Leo float array below. Over on the left-hand side, we see a box uh, labeled uh, the sco uh, scoreboard for the Leo floats. This is the unit that ensures that the primitives uh, exit the Leo float array in the same order that they entered so that we get this uh, semantics of uh, proper rendering order. And Leo turned out to be so balanced that enabling the scoreboard, which in some machines reduces their throughput by a factor of two, made only a 3% difference in our throughput. On the right-hand side of the, uh, this slide, you see a box labeled blit rop font. It, we were trying to minimize the overhead of context switching, Leo, that although we context switch the 3D pipeline fairly efficiently, it does take some amount of overhead. We discovered that most context switches were not due to 3D operations, but due to the window system tripping about through different windows completely asynchronously from what the, the uh, 3D pipeline is doing. And indeed, on a multiprocessor, it can be in a totally separate processor. So we built a completely parallel hardware context for 2D window system operations so that no additional overhead is required um, for the 2D operations to proceed totally in parallel with the 3D operations. And this uh, Leo command featureless slide uh, should hopefully summarize uh, all the things that I just said. Good, I didn't miss anything this time. Okay, and we'll move on then to uh, Leo Float. Leo Float is a custom graphics microprocessor. We took a look at a wide variety of off-the-shelf DSP chips, uh, RISC processors and floating point processors before deciding to build our own processor. What we found is most chips, uh, off-the-shelf chips, required uh, far too many support chips um, to be used, especially when being deployed in parallel. That our goal was not only low cost, but low physical size and low heat. And we found that most of commercial chips just were precluded um, by all this additional overhead. We also considered the alternative of gathering up all these support chips into a single glue chip, uh, as was, uh, and then coupled to a commercial DSP chip, as was used in Silicon Graphics Reality Engine. However, even this, uh, we felt, was going to take up more room than we can afford. Uh, and it was actually uh, turned out to be relatively inexpensive to design our own special purpose floating point unit. And that's what we did. So you can see that Leo Float incorporates right inside of it these decoupling FIFOs, input and output FIFOs, that most parallel architectures have. Uh, and its only support chips required are the external microcode uh, and microdata uh, static RAM. Now, another problem with many DSP chips is they don't have enough registers. Uh, in Leo Float, we cheated. We first wrote all our microcode, uh, or almost all our microcode, that we're going to use in the final product, took a look at how many registers we used in the largest interesting inner loop, and built that many registers right into the chip. So Leo Float has 288 um, floating point registers. What this means is that these registers act as an on-chip cache or on-chip SRAM very efficiently. So during normal uh, processing, we almost never are uh, uh, pulling data from off-chip in the SRAM, but only instructions. So a fairly narrow 32-bit uh, instruction bus was more than enough to keep the chip running at full tilt. OK, let's take a look inside Leo Float. Uh, Leo Float has a number of register files. We're very clever the way we arranged these. Um, only one of those register files is triple ported. The others are only dual ported. So we got a lot of registers, but without paying a huge overhead for six ported register files, as might be in other architectures. You can then see below the register files, we have a two clock tick latency um, floating point uh, multiplier, a three latency um, floating point uh, adder ALU, uh, and a one clock tick latency uh, integer ALU. In addition, there is a reciprocal unit floating point uh, that is in a fire and forget. It takes 11 clock cycles for it to complete, um, but you can initiate it at any point in time. Um, in all of the floating point units, you can otherwise, though, you can issue a new floating point multiplier ad, ad every cycle. Now, there are several additional pieces of magic in Leo Float having to do with individual instructions that don't show at this diagram. Uh, in the slide after next, I'll cover those in more detail. First, though, um, since uh, many people uh, looking at talks and hot chips are, are, have long, long debates about instruction execution pipelines, I thought I'd speak a little bit to how our execution pipeline in a specialized processor was a little bit different than what you find in the more general processors. At the top of the diagram there, we have the 
are, we look fairly traditional in that we have an instruction fetch stage, an instruction decode, early branch stage, a register fetch stage, um, a variable cycle ALU stage, uh, and finally a register store. But when you take a look at the microinstruction word, you find that unlike a conventional processors where these stages are uh, forwarded by uh, special logic from one instruction, um, LeoFloat is much more like the old uh, line traditional horizontal microcoded machines in that every cycle there are bits in the instruction words that say exactly what this cycle uh, registers will be transferred, uh, what arithmetic function will be executed, and so forth. And it's actually the job of the assembler to break up uh, more traditional instructions into multiple instructions over time. So at the bottom of the diagram um, there, you see that we have the instruction semantics in our assembler of D equals A times B plus C. This is written as one line of assembly code, but is actually skewed over seven different instructions um, by the microassembler in the format in the middle of the slide there. We can see we have our major op code and all the source and destination or register buses. And this greatly simplified a lot of the hardware we had to build. Okay, well, let me speak to some of the other special features in Leo Float. It literally has dozens of specialized hardware function units and instructions for 3D graphics. Um, besides the floating point processing I already described, it also has uh, specialized uh, clip test instructions and clip test bits. Uh, a more simpler version of these uh, uh, first showed up in some of the uh, last Apollo machines and a couple of the newer uh, Hewitt Packard architectures. Um, we also have a large number of other specialized condition code bits and special branch instructions to take advantage of these condition bits. Um, one of the ways we avoided branching was just by grouping up large numbers of bits you might want to branch on into one branch instruction. And so rather than have to take three separate branches for three separate possible exceptions, you just waited until you gathered them all up and then did only one conditional branch. We also have some instructions such as floating point absolute value and floating point clamp to the range zero to one um, that are used to eliminate the, uh, the otherwise need, many of the needs for branching because it's all done straight in line. Um, there are also instructions for automatically acquiring and uh, dispatching uh, geometry packets, which would take dozens of instructions on a conventional processor, but is built right into our protocol engine. There's also instructions to rearrange the vertices um, in memory when doing uh, working on the setup portion uh, of the uh, uh, processing of triangles. And as I mentioned, the only support chips required by Leo are their external microcode, which we have 128K 32-bit uh, words up. Okay, well, before getting to the draw section proper, I need to address VRAM. VRAM is the major bottleneck uh, in building uh, such high-performance systems. Now, in the last five years, we've been fairly fortunate that the bit density of VRAM has been steadily increasing at a fairly significant clip. And correspondingly, the price per bit of DRAM has been decreasing at a fairly significant amount. But unfortunately, the cycle time of VRAM has been getting faster only by a very small amount. As you can see from the diagram, in the last five years, we've really only gotten about 20, 25% increase in the speed of VRAM. Um, this makes it very hard to build much faster accelerators. Indeed, for the last three generations of RAM, five-way interleaving was the highest level of interleaving we could achieve, uh, which limits our full cycle time. Nevertheless, our goal for Leo Draw, or the Leo Draw chip, part of the Leo architecture, was to be able to drive VRAM at their absolute maximum rate, to be able to get as much rendering out of the uh, limited VRAM bandwidth as possible. And as much as I just bemoan the limitations of VRAM, um, there still are quite a number of pins on them, and it, it is not very easy to take a single chip and get it to drive all those VRAM at the same time. Other low-cost architectures have to use external multiplexers and data latches to do this. But for us, those multiplexers and data latches were just as expensive as additional custom chips. So we instead took the approach with Leo um, to make one relatively inexpensive draw chip, Leo Draw, and multiplex it five ways, spatially interleaving the chips, um, in order to be able to drive the VRAM at absolutely full tilt. Uh, and the result was the Leo Draw. Leo Draw's main job is to render triangles, uh, any alias lines, alias lines, any alias dots, uh, and I guess alias dots. Um, it also performs uh, 
uh, transparency via both uh, alpha blend transparency algorithm and depth queue, uh, it's, and, uh, and uh, screen door transparency, depth queue is the uh, next bullet there. We perform a per pixel individual depth queue, uh, which also can be thought of as a uh, haze uh, algorithm, as I'll uh, show a little bit later. Um, and this gives a much higher quality depth queuing, and it also doesn't require any slowdown in speed. Because although depth queuing is not found in industry benchmarks, a lot of users use it, and we were des designing this machine for users, not just for benchmarks. Well, we also have to uh, perform regular 2D window system functionality for the machines to be uh, useful, and so we have the usual plethora of blitz, ROPs, fonts, and individual pixel read and write support. We also optimize two critical functions. We have a ridiculously fast screen clear of 120 um, microseconds, something like 7 billion uh, pixels uh, uh, per second of clear. Uh, and we also have an optimized vertical scroll because these machines are also used for doing uh, text editing. I know that when I use um, uh, my Leo, my uh, workstation on my desk, when I'm doing software debugging, the most heavily used graphics feature is vertical scroll. Um, and finally, as I mentioned before, there are no support chips required for Leo Draw. It interfaces directly to the VRAM and DRAM frame buffer array. The final chip in the pipeline is Leo Cross. It performs the fairly traditional back-end functions of sophisticated 3D graphics accelerators, but in a very untraditional uh, package, one chip plus the RAM DAC and clock generator. It contains multiple color lookup tables to avoid color map flashing and to support different color spaces. It contains a crossbar to switch between um, render uh, frame um, buffers and display buffers, as well as switching in overlay planes in the cursor. It has an onboard 32 by 32 cursor and has a fairly flexible video timing generator that not only supports tra uh, traditional workstation resolutions, but also NTSC and PAL uh, timings though still requiring an external encoder uh, for composite output, as well as special video formats for uh, square pixel stereo display and specialized virtual reality devices. Um, if we're serious about virtual reality becoming uh, an industry, we have to start putting support for it in our mainline machines. And we are happy with uh, the Leo system to be able to support not only square pixel stereo, but support in the window system so that individual windows can be uh, enabled as stereo or not and otherwise all function cleanly under the existing X11 window system. Okay, a few words about our design environment. Um, because we knew that many of the LEO chips would be very data path intensive, uh, we didn't just want to use a uh, gate array process. So we chose a Genesil uh, silicon compiler approach for LEO uh, command, uh, LEO float, and LEO draw. And this worked out uh, uh, fairly well. We could have built these chips out of gate arrays, but they would have been much more expensive. Um, one of the advantages of Genesil, of course, is that we can target multiple different foundries, and so we'll be spinning these chips in a variety of different fabs. Um, but the first one we started off with is a 0.8 micron uh, double metal single poly CMOS. Leo Cross, the challenge was not data path, but simply sheer numbers of pins. Um, although we are generally try to minimize the pins, as you'll see in a moment, to only around 200 per chip, Leo Cross, we would have required five chips at a 200 pin count. And if we, so long as we were able to get 400 pins, we were able to do it in one chip. And there, it was actually easier to take advantage of uh, gate array processes that were already set up for large numbers of pins, where price wasn't as much of an object. So we used an LSI Logic uh, 100K master slice for Leo Cross. And the master slice was used to implement um, some of the additional lookup tables that we have there as individual RAMs. The speed target uh, for the Genesil chips was 25 megahertz, uh, which we exceeded. And for those of you not familiar with how Genesil works, it actually does two logic evaluations per nominal clock cycle. So the internal design is actually a lot more like a 50 megahertz design might be in another uh, system. Um, Leo Cross had a target of 67 megahertz, or one half our maximum video frequency of 135 megahertz. We wrote a complete simulator for the system in C. Um, there was literally generating pictures within weeks of the start of the project and all along gave us something to be able to compare and target what the silicon was supposed to be doing. Um, with a complex as system as this, with as complex as individual chips, it was also very important to do gate level simulation. And we eventually got rid of more than 50 suns we had randomly strewn about 
um, the lab and replaced it with one large uh, ZICAD gate level simulator. We not only simulated the individual chips in the ZICAD, we also wired up multiple chips into a system and actually simulated the entire system at the gate level. And this found numerous simple protocol bugs we otherwise wouldn't have found until the getting the first chips back. As a result, three of the four chips were completely functional on the first pass. And the fourth chip was functional enough that we were able to get the system up and rendering pictures in a window system literally within days of receipt of the chips. And then it was a fairly minor turn of the uh, fourth chip to get that running for production. Okay. A few co comments on the individual IC details. Um, our goal was to keep most of the chips under 100,000 gates. And as you can see, we succeeded, most of them around 80,000 gates. Um, and the number of transistors is roughly 300,000 per chip. Um, our goal was not to build a gigantic uh, chip, but to build, I wasn't interested in, the, in most transistors in a chip. I was interested in getting the most number of triangles per dollar. And it was much easier to go with a chip lower in the knee of the yield curve where we get very good prices and build a few more of them uh, than it was to go to a larger chip. The die size in the right hand there show that most of the chips were in the uh, mid 500s. Now this is with a particular process that we started off with. The numerous other processes where the same chip via Genesel can be shrunk down to a much more uh, aggressive size. And finally you can see the pin count in the right where the uh, only one that really won over was Leo Cross and that was a legitimate trade-off where we managed to do one chip in the place of five. Well, as a result of all this, here's an image of the Leo board set. Uh, it is a dual S-Bus card. Those two boards uh, uh, sandwiched together into a single uh, board, as I'll show in the next slide. We just pulled them apart here, so you can see the individual chips. They take two S-Bus slots wide, but only one S-Bus uh, slot tall. Um, as a result, the entire system fits in less than 23 cubic inches, which is less than one-third the volume of, say, the corresponding machine from Silicon Graphics. And as a result, we can plug the LEO system into uh, a very compact uh, system. The next slide shows the complete LEO workstation um, next to two of our units of uh, uh, reference for volume, uh, Foley, uh, Van Dam, uh, and Feiner, uh, along with the LEO board set. The box on the left there is the LEO workstation. It contains the LEO, um, a gigabyte disk drive, um, 32 meg of memory and the CPU all in one incredibly small size box. And this was a result of us being able to use um, uh, going to such a compact chipset and requiring almost no uh, glue chips. Well, um, in conclusion, I'll give the performance of the LEO system. Um, LEO does 310,000 grow shaded unlit, chained, z-buffered, depth-cued uh, 3D triangles per second. When going to lighted triangles, Leo does one quarter million isolated uh, gross shaded z-buffered, depth-cued, lighted triangles per second. Uh, does about three quarters of a million alias vectors and about half a million any alias vectors with a very high quality any alias vector algorithm. There's a three pixel wide Gaussian uh, filter and a uh, two pixel endpoint ramp with uh, s intensity slope correction and correction for very short vectors. Um, we also do an excess of a million 3 by 3 n alias dots per second um, and uh, do 150,000 uh, uh, raster characters per second. And as I mentioned before, our screen clear is uh, under 200 uh, microseconds. Okay. Um, benchmarks are very contentious area nowadays. So I give these benchmarks as an example to disclaimers. If I had to give full disclaimers, it would go on for several pages of legalese per slide. The bottom line is LEO is a very balanced architecture in unreal applications. Uh, the performance does not drop very much from what you see in the marketing benchmarks. And this is, not, uh, this is unlike many other contemporary products. Well, I'll conclude uh, with a depth cute or haze image drawn on LEO. Uh, this is an image that can actually be rotated in real time. I think it's our founder's Porsche. Someone claimed it wasn't because it was the wrong color and I had to point out, well, he has several. Um, but this is the sort of imagery that is now available in very inexpensive platforms. And this is what uh, the Leo architecture has been able to bring um, to the marketplace. Thank you.